Hey everyone, this is Ross Ratty, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast style video that I do for you guys every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern. We talk a lot about fruits and um, a lot about vegetables. We like to talk though about the weird and interesting fruits and vegetables that you probably never heard of. Um, I just got myself the Baker Creek catalog and that's chock full of weird and interesting varieties of, uh, of food. Um, really this podcast is meant to be kind of an informative view on growing food. Whatever, whatever it is that I'm doing, whatever I'm interested in, in this current moment, um, I like to share my journey along the way with you guys. So if you enjoy food, you enjoy growing, this is really the podcast for you. Um, in today's episode, we're going to talk about the persimmon and how amazing that fruit really is it's it is incredible um i think it actually is my favorite fruit now and i hesitate to say this because i haven't really had a a perfect persimmon right next to a perfectly ripe fig uh but i'll tell you this getting a perfectly ripe persimmon is a lot easier than getting a perfectly ripe fig where i live and um, maybe I can just achieve a better quality of persimmon that I can't with the figs, and that's why. There's certainly a wider variety of flavors and textures and just overall weirdness with the figs. Um, the persimmons, you know, they're, they're kind of more cut and dry. They're all sort of similar to each other, and, you know, they're not exactly the same thing, but... Um, uh, definitely less so to the degree that figs are. Figs are pretty incredible in that way. And I also really like how you can grow figs. There's so many different methods and ways and, and techniques and things to learn that uh, you wouldn't think of. And they really can bend to your will. You can really control, at least I can, really control a fig tree really well and and command it really to what I want it to do. Um it's just been a very interesting fruit tree to grow. The persimmon I find to be a little similar to the fig in terms of kind of weird little aspects of it. Um, But it is a very different fruit in that the tree is like, is just totally different, you know? Um, even the fruit is, you could say, is totally different. But I've had some um, some persimmons this year that were really pretty close to dried up and really gooey and really actually jammy, and we're on the uh, the jamminess scale of some figs that I've had. They really were. It's like eating jam, and I was really impressed by that. And that's kind of what is making me switch over to persimmons, or at least say that persimmons are my favorite. Um, you know, if you've been watching this podcast at all, you know how much we love to talk about figs. Uh, but I want to talk more about persimmons. And I think in the YouTube channel, in the next couple of days, in the next week or so, we're going to have like a nice week of persimmons talking about them, different things that I'm going to be doing. We're going to prune some. Um, we're going to be drying some. I, I did get a decent crop this year, but nothing really spectacular. Um, so I went out and bought myself some Hychea from the store and it's unfortunate, but we're going to make ourselves some, uh, Hashigoki it's called, or Hoshigaki. I think that's how you pronounce it. And you can see pictures of them right here. This is really what, uh, I wanted to show you guys in these photos is that it's pretty simple in that we take a Hychea type persimmon, you leave on the, the calyx here. We get some string and um, we tie a string to the calyx, hang it from something. We peel the skin off. And by peeling the skin off, I guess it really helps these things dry quicker. If you have the skin on, it takes a bit longer. I don't think people really like the skin. It's a bit tough. I don't know. Maybe it takes something away from the, the overall product. But this is a big process that people do in Japan and um, it's a shame I've really never had a persimmon like this in this dried state like this I have had some fuyu 
which sort of were dried in this manner, but yeah, sort of like this here where they're flattened. But this is nothing compared to something like this. This is a, a whole different animal. I mean, this is like, you get the right persimmon and you dry it like this way, it really is a is a totally different experience than some of this dried stuff that you uh, you can get at the store. And yeah, you can actually get these. It's pretty hard to find. It's hard to find persimmons at all, but I have a local uh, Asian grocery store by me that actually sells these dried persimmons, these dried fuyu. And I just don't, I don't really like them nearly as much. I think they have the skin on as well. And uh, the quality is never really that great. So maybe I would like some fuyu if you could, if I could grow them myself and then dry them myself, I would probably like them. You can see they kind of flatten a bit here and then they crystallize with sugar. And that's just a natural process. There's nothing added to this. Um, and it takes about 30-ish days, I believe, 20 to 30 days. You hang them up and you just get this incredible product. And you can do this to varying degrees. You don't, you don't have to do a perfectly dried persimmon like this. You know, you can really um, experiment with the levels of dryness that you're going for. I think to get the optimal products and what these people do in in uh, in Japan is they get it to kind of a dried enough exterior, but the inside is still gooey. Um, like a really awesome persimmon would be. So you kind of get half dried, half gooey, and I'm expecting them to be just incredible. Um, I've also done it this way, which I've done videos on, where we cut them into slices, put them in a dehydrator, and they come out really well, especially Hychia. Fuyu is really not that great, I've found, these Fuyu types here. The Hychias and the other, the more elongated types of persimmons, um, the acorn-shaped persimmons like this, these seem to be better for drying. Either you can slice them up into like, you know, these thin slices here or dry them whole. They just seem to be better for drying in my opinion. And the drying process with these types removes that astringency. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. You know, I feel like the fuyu is really just meant to be eaten fresh. You know, that's kind of its main purpose. And maybe I'm wrong, but I've yet to find a, a fuyu that really blew me away in terms of a dried persimmon. Um, you know, I'm able to dry the 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 hychias at home and in, in these little slices, and it beats this every time. Um, but then again, I'm the one controlling the moisture level, right? I'm the one getting that right the right texture that I want in the in the dried persimmon. So it's really kind of up to you, and you can kind of do this how you want. But this is so traditional in Japan, and that they hang them from whatever they can, put them in a windy location, somewhere dry. And about 20 to 30 days later, they they dry up. The other thing they have to do is that people, they squeeze them. And I don't know why you squeeze them, to be f totally honest with you. I don't know why that is. Um, I guess it's kind of to kind of get out a little bit more of that moisture or to feel the right... Um, the right interior texture that you're going for, but uh, apparently they squeeze them. I watched a video on this, and they they squeeze them to get out some of these some of the moisture in them, and they do this like a couple times throughout the process to get them. I don't know. Maybe it's a thing you don't really need to do. I'm not sure, but point is, we bought some. Um. And we're going to dry them this way. I haven't, I didn't really think of peeling them first and then drying them. Um, so this is going to be like brand new for me is really getting them to that, this point here. And um, see how this one, if you cut this, like this thing's cut open here, it's pretty dry on the inside. You know, this is like a date at this point. You know, I kind of see this in the texture of more of like, um, like a potato. Um, you're kind of eating a really sweet potato when it's fully dried like this. I don't want that. I don't want to go for that texture. Um, 
and that that graininess almost. I want to go for um, you know, like like that gooey, jammy interior that some of these will produce. So that's what I'm going for. That's what we're gonna try to do. I'll do a video on it. Hopefully, you guys can watch that on the uh, the YouTube channel. Here's like another one right here. If you can see the inside, well, this part here maybe might be that perfect consistency we're going for. You know, um, this is just. These things are incredible. I mean, just look at that. What's also really cool about this is that the fig can't really do this. I have one fig that I think if I were to pick it, I would be able to get them dried. Like if I were to pick them and then let them sit, they would dry. But that's like one out of a thousand, two thousand varieties, three thousand varieties. Whereas the persimmon, almost all of them do this. I mean, they just have this really awesome characteristic, this drying capability to them. Um, they're such a wonderful fruit. There's like such weird, interesting characteristics to them um, that enable you to do this. Um, it's really weird. And, you know, like I was saying, like the fig has all these special things about it. So does the persimmon. Um, and this is one of them, I think, where you, you're able to kind of dry the persimmon like this. That's pretty special, you know? Name another fruit you can do this to. Um, I mean, I guess you need the right climate. You need the right environment. But most of the time, if I were to take a fig and just string it up and hang it, it probably would mold. Um, some of them, of course, I've talked about in the past and I have experienced that where I even just put them on my counter and they definitely dry up right there. But to the extent that they're drying up like this is crazy. And they have, um, like not only is the persimmon, uh, there's, I believe there's some sort of chemical in the persimmon. I watched a video on these a while ago. It was like, uh, it was about two weeks ago. And they were mentioning this persimmon, this chemical in them that really uh, preserves wood, as an example. Um, they'll finish wood with it and it really preserves even paper and fans and different artwork and things that they use it for. Um, they have It has like this really special pres preservative characteristic to it. Um, you can, I think you, you basically take persimmons and just let them ferment for like a year or two and it turns into this liquid and then that liquid can then be put onto all kinds of different things. Um, you know, the, what I will say about the persimmon as we go on here is that it's such a popular fruit outside of the U.S. that it's kind of crazy to think that this isn't popular. I've really been dumbfounded by it. Um, and it's mainly because I, I gave, I really tested this theory. I gave a couple friends some persimmons this year and I told them very ex explicit instructions. I said, don't eat this until it's softer than a tomato. And every single one of them ate it too soon. And didn't enjoy it. Uh, of course, these were the astringent types, but they're like, Ross, what, what is the big deal? You basically gave me the worst mouth experience ever. Uh, what did you do to me? And um, I told them what would happen if they ate it too soon. They didn't, clearly they didn't get it um, to the right point. And it took me a while this year to get them to the right point before I was eating them because we had some that got hit with a frost and that artificially ripened some of the persimmons and got them to this point where uh, my persimmons looked like they were ripe, but they really just weren't. And it was very strange. It was a weird phenomenon. And this is like the first year I really let them get hit with a frost and I didn't like how it worked out. What I'm learning here is that, yes, you can let your persimmons hang on the tree all the way until March, even maybe even spring. Um, Edible Landscaping, as an example, they put out a video. Um, so EdibleLandscaping.com, they did a video on YouTube about all the different varieties that they're growing, if this would load. 
And as a result, they um, they were talking about how some of their varieties actually don't ripen all the way until March. And of course, they're getting hit with a lot of frost from, you know, our first frost in early November all the way till March. That's a lot of frost. That's a lot of artificial ripening that's occurring, or at least they're trying to help it ripen. And some varieties are okay with that. But I'm realizing that if I'm going to sell these fruits, if I was going to be a persimmon orchardist here in Pennsylvania, I would need a variety that could ripen before or mostly ripen before the frost comes in. Because as soon as that frost comes in, it hits the fruit and it artificially ripens it and it makes it seem like the fruit's ready, but it's not. And it's very confusing. It's very strange. And my friends were totally thrown off by it. I was a little bit thrown off by it. Unfortunately, no one had asked me, should I eat it now, Ross? But um, the point is, you know, no one is really liking this fruit unless it's perfectly ripe. And I think that's the trick. I even went to H Mart today before filming this video the grocery store near me. It's an Asian grocery store. Um, and I asked the guy what the prices were. And he told me, he didn't understand me. Um, and he started talking about how this one here, you're supposed to let it, let it ripen for a long time. And this one you can eat right away. He's like, this one, let it ripen for a long time. This one... <laughs> You can eat right away. But I was like, no, 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 I understand that. Well, what about the price? And um, he, uh, it was just funny to hear him explain that because if he didn't explain that, um, people just don't get it. People will never really get it. And he probably looked at me and was like, oh, that's a white guy. He's probably never eaten a persimmon. That's what he's probably wanting to know is, you know, when should I eat these things? And um, I don't blame him for that at all, to be honest with you. Um, but it just is funny to just think about, you know, what the education that needs to go into this fruit before you could even think about selling it. Um, so my idea here was to do this, was to make hoshigaki. Maybe I said it better that way. But... Hoshigaki um, is already dried. It already lost that astringency taste. I could probably charge a really crazy premium for them because they are such an incredible product. I mean, if you eat one of these things, you're going to be like, whoa. You're going to probably think it's some kind of dessert that I created. <laughs> um, or if you did this yourself, as an example. Um, if I were to bite into this thing, I'd be in heaven. This thing right here. This is incredible. And, you know, it's such a rare thing that some, that people are just not doing here that I feel like there's got to be a market for these somewhere. And I think people would really enjoy them. Would they enjoy the, the persimmon that's not um, – that needs to be eaten softer than a tomato? I think so, but there just needs to be a lot of education before they can eat them. And um, – I think that's a tougher thing to do than this, this drying process, this hoshigaki thing right here. Um, so that's that's my goal from this point on because of how awesome and how much I love this fruit now. Uh, I want other people to experience this and um, I'm on this like mission now. And the next week, like I said, I'm going to do all kinds of different things. So this, we could talk about we're going to talk about pruning in a different video. Um, I want to talk to you guys about this book. And I want to talk about a couple of things I've learned in the book, uh, what I got out of this. Um, and I want to do a video of me eating one of these damn things, one of these persimmons, because there's an incredible... I'll show you the experience. I want to show it to you guys, my experience of how I came to the conclusion that this fruit is so damn good. Um, 
you know, I've been into this this persimmon that I grew, that I ripened to perfection, bit into that, and could not believe how good it was. Um, I think it's better than any persimmon I've ever had, and I've had Honan Red from my buddy um, in California. Oh, I'm blanking on his name. So sorry. But uh, if you're watching, those were like the best persimmons I've ever had at the time. I had a Sejo from my friend Phil. That was incredible. Then I had some Honan Red that were grown in California and sent to me from California. And that's just nuts. Those were incredible. Uh, they have the, mo the most incredible flavor to them. Then I grew my own persimmon, ripened that thing to perfection, and I couldn't believe how good it was. So... I think mine even competed with the quality that I was tasting off the Honan Red, which is a better variety. A taste should be a tastier variety. And uh, it was grown in a place that's more conducive to persimmons. But the persimmon, as I'm pretty much reading in this book and I've really known for a while now, it can be grown anywhere. Um, it really can. I mean, this thing... If it survives the winter time, and there's a bit of a trick, right? There's some a lot of persimmons that are surviving like negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit. There's some that are said to survive negative 20. There's the American types, which can go maybe even down to negative 25. You find the right seedling. You find, um, you know, trial and error with some Virginiana seedlings, some American. American persimmon seedlings. You could probably get one that grows no problem in zone five maybe even zone four and that would be pretty that would be pretty special um but they are native here to the americas they are found in pretty cold places here um deer love them nothing bothers them you don't have to spray them you don't have to really look after them you can pretty much neglect them and i found through this book neglecting them is pretty a pretty good strategy and as we know through other videos I've been doing on persimmons and also other fruits, growing fruit trees is is quite difficult if you baby them. If you neglect them, uh, everything seems to be a hell of a lot easier. I do want to mention this book. I was told about this book on uh, Persimmon World. It's a Facebook group that I'm a part of on Facebook. You can join. Anyone can join. A couple of my friends are in it. One of my, I think my friend runs it. I have two friends, I think, that run it. The Michigan boys, they run it, um, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, there's people in there like Cliff England, uh, other big players in persimmons, and um, just a lot of people who like persimmons. There's not really the most in-depth conversation going on. I really had to buy this book to really find out all the answers. This is a Persimmon Culture in New Zealand. This is apparently the Bible of persimmons the best information that is out there it cost me 25 bucks including shipping um, it's hard to find man I couldn't get this book it took me a while to get one for a decent price uh, uh, you can get them here if you're lucky I think this one came from a place called um, Terrace Terrace something something um, let me find out. I have the pamphlet here somewhere. Yeah. Terrace Horticultural Books. And you may be able to call them up. Uh, terrace at winternet.com. So winternet.com. Terrace Horticultural Books.com. They may have this book. And they have other books. And I have their. I have their website open up in a, on a different computer um, that I'm going to definitely check out and see what else they have because I, there may be something else that I want to pick up from them. It's hard to find these books, man. You know, There's only so many of them. There's not many of them in the United States. Um, you know, I don't know. Interesting. The photo was taken by a guy named Ross. <laughs> All right, so on to the book here. What's in this book? Well, I'm going to give you guys the rundown here about what I 
discovered. But there's things in here like um, different varieties, um, the classification of persimmons and you know what persimmon that they're actually talking about, talking about rootstocks and prop propagating them, um, shoot growth and flowering, pollination, fruit drop. That was one that I was really interested. Defoliation, cracking, uh, fruit growth, orchard management, things like pruning and planting sites and irrigation, harvesting and storage and processing, um, how to remove the astringency. There's different methods that they mentioned and then also marketing them. Um, it says Japan as a market for New Zealand persimmons. They wanted to, I guess, in New Zealand grow persimmons commercially. Um, and that's kind of what this book does. It really uh, kind of labels out how to accomplish this in um, a different, you know, a number of different ways. And it's pretty good. I think if you're interested, it's worth picking it up. So one of the big things I came I came out of this with was that essentially kind of goes back to what you can almost say about every fruit tree and that if you have the wrong amount of nitrogen or the wrong amount of shoot growth, if you have too much growth, your fruit suffers and that you don't get enough production. Um, so you want to make sure that you're pretty much doing everything you can, especially on younger trees, to stop them from growing too vigorously. So if you feed them too much, you water them too much, um, you prune them too heavily, that can change the hormones in the plant and cause them to grow very vigorously the following season. Um, so that was kind of the big takeaway of what I wanted to figure out. because. Young persimmons particularly will drop fruits. It takes about, you can, you can get lucky and have a, a two-year-old persimmon fruit for you, even three years old, even four years old, but really around year five and six, they really start to slow down a bit and get their act together, and then they stop dropping their fruits. And they talk about in the book, pollinating the fruits by hand or getting a male pollinator, a male um, a male persimmon to help pollinate or a variety with enough male flowers. And they talk about, you know, how to differentiate between a male flower, a female flower or, herma or hermaphrodite flower. Um, they say that hand pollination is the best way to get these things to stop dropping. And um, if you actually were, were to pollinate the flowers artificially, you'll get about only 5%, uh, five, well, maybe about 10%, 10 to 15% fruit drop. There's a chart here that I'm looking at in the book that they're, they're mentioning. Um, it happens in, in about three stages, the fruit drop. But if you were to um, not pollinate them, and you were to bag the fruits so that nothing was pollinating the fruits because the persimmon, depending on the variety, is parthenocarpic, just like figs. They, they will fruit for themselves. They don't need something else to help them. But uh, if you do pollinate them, the number of fruit drop, the drop, the percentage of dropped fruits goes way down. You're looking at about 40% fruit drop if you don't pollinate them. Uh, it can get even higher than that. You know, um, so if you got yourself a male in the area or you're you're pollinating them yourself, your chances go way up. Um, regardless of the age, it seems like here. Some other things I've learned about fruit drop. This has been the biggest question for me and the biggest question for a lot of people. We talked about reducing the excess growth. Um, you know, if it's growing too much, it's more likely to drop fruits. Um, also, if it has too much water at the time of bloom, um, you can also cause fruit drop. Uh, if you have um, not enough sunlight, it can also drop fruits. So what I'm going to do here, because I've realized that uh, my tree has been dropping. It's four years old. I have a number of trees, but the, the Rosianca actually in the front of the house 
is still dropping fruits in its fourth year. It's a big tree. It's a healthy tree. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, other than it just grows too quickly. So what I need to do is slow down the growth. Uh, that's goal number one. And how I'm going to accomplish this is, one, I don't water them at all. I'm not going to feed them at all. In fact, I'm going to try to take away some of that topsoil and see if that helps this year. Um, but I think a lot of it is going to come down to the pruning that I do right now. And I've already started to somewhat prune them, which is a bit unfortunate because I don't think I, I think I got ahead of myself maybe. I'm not sure. We'll see how it all works out next year, but um, I don't really want to be pruning too much. Uh, you really want to be very lightly pruning, just like figs. I was very surprised to learn that you really just don't want to prune them. Um, I am going to be doing an open center style this year. I think with all the persimmons I have, except for maybe some in the in the on the um, the east side of my house, I think I'm going to let them maintain that central leader form that they like to have. They like to be a central leader. That's the more natural form that they get. But I will. Um, in lower light areas of the property, because I have them all over the place, um, the, in those areas, I'm going to do it into an open vase, an open center um, form of pruning. So this year, I'm going to come out with the Brosianca. We're going to film it. We're going to cut out a lot of that growth to open it up and to get that open center form that we want. Um, it's also going to help control the height of the tree. And um, this would be really good, I think, for getting more light into the tree, which is going to help hopefully get me more fruits, more fruit set next year. I don't have any male trees, and I don't have any pollen of male trees, so I'm not entirely sure how, if I'm going to really be hand pollinating these things. I doubt it. Um, I'm kind of just going to have to hope to get what I can get uh, and see if you know, these techniques that I'm going to be doing is going to really help. Um, I'm sure they will, but again, it's, it's going to be a bit of a challenge, um, especially because these trees are too young. My soil is too heavy. It has too much nutrients in it. We get a lot of water here. Um, it just can be an issue. So that's the big takeaway from this book, but um, I also learned about Unfortunately, they didn't mention too much about frost in here and what that does to the fruits. Maybe I missed it. But uh, I would have preferred, to, I think in the future, I'm going to prefer to pick the fruits before the frost unless it's a late ripening variety. And in general, just pick varieties that will ripen in time here before the frost. Um, and other fruits... You know, other varieties like the Jiro and the Fuyu types, those apparently, according to the book, they need more sunlight, more heat to, to ripen properly, to, um, to really get them to the perfect fruit quality. Um, apparently, that's a bit of an issue, and some of these fruits can have um, fruit quality problems if you're not growing them with enough heat. And I don't know personally if that's accurate, but that's what I read here in this book. Um, they also mentioned in here, which I found to be very interesting, because I was interested about it uh, this season is, and I was, I think even last season is that my persimmon, because I get so much growth here, or soil's too heavy, we have too much water, um, my persimmon likes to grow and grow and grow, especially because it's young too. That's another reason. And it grows, it puts out one growth spur, and then later in the season, it puts out another growth spur, and then it's done. On that second growth spur, it actually flowers again. It flowers twice. And uh, they talk about in the book, if it be possible on that second flower set, you know, you can get those to get pollinated. I have gotten some fruits this year that held on and ripened in time. 
but the fruit quality seemed to really be low and they were mentioning somewhere in the book a couple times whether or not it would be they thought it'd be interesting to test whether or not that could be a viable option is to get a crop off of the second growth spurt um when they flower again and uh i don't know it's an interesting thought i'm just trying to get one crop right now (laughs) trying to get one reliable crop if i can get 200 300 persimmons next year i'll be real happy and um you know they're not going to be like the peaches where i have a really short window to eat them i mean i guess i could process the peaches too but you know uh these persimmons man they, they'll last all winter time i could dry these things make a really awesome product out of it um yeah this fruit's incredible so i i didn't really convince you guys too much on why this fruit is my favorite as of today but uh we're going to talk a lot more about them in future videos so i hope you guys enjoy this episode of fruit talk i know i did um it's a topic of great interest to me so yeah tune in for more talks about persimmons and uh we'll talk to you guys soon all right take care and uh we'll see you next week everyone